So we usually, as, as ex-Muslims and atheists from different backgrounds, we, we talk a lot about, about the pain and the difficult times we've been through because that's part of our journey. We, we have been through a lot of challenges and we face um, battles on a daily basis with, with close and beloved ones, um, let alone the, the whole world. Um, but we also take times to celebrate. We celebrate our great moments, our inspiring times. We celebrate our achievements, the great campaigns we've won. And uh, uh, today we, we, would like, we would like also to take a moment to uh, celebrate our supporters and the great people who've been around um, through the years. So please, can I welcome um, the organizing committee, Mariam, Sadia and Sina to the stage to hand out the ceremony. My lovelies, uh, sorry we are uh, running a bit late, uh, but this is uh, not, not the last or the least. It's a very, very important section for us because it's people that we really want to honor uh, because of their, uh, their work and their support and their influence. Uh, um, so there, there's a couple of people uh, who we'd like to name. One person who's actually not on this list, we wanted to surprise her. Um, but uh, let's start first with the wonderful, uh, the most amazing AC Grayling. And now this man, you know, <laughs> you know, th this man, I mean, I'm a bloody immigrant, right? So I came in uh, 2000. I didn't know who AC Grayling was. And when we started the Council of Ex-Muslims, we had our launch, very few people had come, and then there was this man with this gorgeous hair who was there. And of course, everyone who knew was like, that's AC Grayling. I was like, really? You know, he's, he's amazing, he's famous. And of course, even before we had our launch, he had written an article about us, I mean us, who people had said, what are you doing this for? You're, 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 you're there to scapegoat Muslims, you're there to, um, increase Islamophobia rather than looking at the need uh, of, of ex-Muslims and he wrote a piece in the Guardian I think that must be the only positive piece ever written about us in the Guardian uh, you know uh, and it was entitled the courage of their convictions and I will always remember that because it just gave us so much strength and support and he has been at every single event of ours until the bloody British government went and started with Brexit. So he's been busy on that as well. Uh, but, but honestly, um, Anthony, you have been such a rock for us. Your influence, your thoughts, your words, your support has been immeasurable and we are so, so grateful for you. And we wanted to give you an award that has been um, made. It's a sculpture by uh, Sudabe Gashtasebi, if you can get up Sudabe, and uh, Stephanie Freeman. The two of them have, if you don't mind standing up, both of you. Um, <laughs> presented to our, our dear, our beloved uh, A.C. Grayling. say that I, I'm, I'm very, very honoured, but also very embarrassed, because there are people in this room, people on the panel, Marion, the team who organised this, who deserve, who really deserve awards, and uh, I feel very humbled in the presence of people for whom this is, you know, a, an immense thing, to, to leave a religion, to lose families, to be under threat, uh, you know, that's serious. I had a very easy time, brought up in a, in a family which didn't have any religion. I first learned uh, really about religion from uh, my mother who was extremely prejudiced. She hated Catholics and Jews and Hindus and Aztecs and Martians and everything. So, uh, my first introduction to religion was through that. But when I read about it, when I saw the oppression of women and of gays and of, and of minds in our world that have come through religion, I thought that, that it was only right, it was just a simple duty to get involved. 
And as a result of getting involved, I've met really wonderful, courageous people like the ones that you've heard from today. And they are the ones who really deserve awards. But thank you so much. For Now this woman, um, I can't tell you how wonderful she is. I mean, she's a lawyer, and uh, yeah, you know, lawyers, you think they only care about themselves. But honestly, for so many years, every few months, she comes to our meetups, uh, explains the asylum process and uh, for, for atheists and apostates. Then she holds one-on-one -on -one workshops and, and uh, uh, meetings with people who have problems with their case. Completely free, and she's taken on many of our pro bono cases. In fact, uh, you know, she was fighting to bring Halima here. You know, we, we had to rely on her help uh, for, for many things, and that's one of them. And I think it's just, you know, if we have any problem, it's like, let's just call Anna, you know? And I do feel sorry for this poor woman <laughs> uh, because she is a very big shot as well. You wouldn't think it with the way, you know, she comes and she talks to people and she spends her time and, and energy, but she's a partner at this brilliant law firm. And, uh, you know, we really thank Wilson. you. Um, Will, yeah, sorry. Her son works there, so there is a level of, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, but honestly, Anna, we thank you so much for your continuous support, your dedication to the cause of ex-Muslims and atheists, and you know that you, we know we, you, we have you always, even though I don't think we know any other lawyer who wants to help us. Um, and, and really, it's, it's you. You are really the lifeline for us in so many cases. So thank you, my darling. It's so great to have you. say that I am humbled um, is actually an understatement, really. I've worked in asylum for over 20 years now. I've dealt with lots of cases and lots of organizations supporting refugees, uh, asylum seekers. Nobody comes close to CEMB. Nobody. The level of support and commitment that they give to people, um, they go and meet people at airports to help, help them claim asylum. They take them to lawyers. They sort of go to them in the middle of the night, they do all sorts of things that, you know, they are unbelievably amazing. And I'm just happy they let me work with them, quite frankly, because it is a real privilege. So, we really... Uh, again, it's, it really sucks that you put me after AC Grey Man. Yeah, quite frankly. Because, you know, I used to echo this great man, yeah? They are the ones who deserve the awards. That's very true. So, you know, I am... Absolutely, truly, truly honored. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we, we've added one more person, we've added two people to our list because we do whatever we like. And that's, that's great when you're not restricted by anything. Uh, but there is someone here that we do need to recognize. And he came to the very first meeting. You know who you are. I'm looking at you. Don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. He's totally ignoring me. <laughs> um, so there, there's this, uh, this, uh, this gentleman, Asad Abbas, who, yes, I know, <laughs> who uh, has, has always been there from the beginning, uh, you know, and uh, when, when it started, when CMB started, you know, he, he did say it was his lifelong dream to see, um, you know, ex-Muslims uh, being out publicly, uh, speaking out, and he has also fought for this for a lifelong, uh, you know, as a lifelong commitment. And he was always there, and he's always been there, you know. And so, as I said, we do want to recognize uh, you, your wonderfulness, your loveliness, your commitment to this cause, and how important you have been for all of us, you know, in encouraging us, uh, pulling us forward, uh, hitting us on the head sometimes, uh, getting mad at us, uh, you know, uh, things that is not always easy sailing is it we've had our arguments 
but you've, you're a very important person to this movement and uh, we would like to recognize you tonight. Well, I'm not much of a speaker anyway, and if I had had some notice about it, possibly I would have <laughs> consulted my friends and I would have drafted a speech and then I would have remembered it by heart and then I would have come out with it. But I have had absolutely no notice. This is a complete surprise to me. I can't honestly tell you how delighted I am. How absolutely delighted I am. I do not think that I have in my non-family life ever had anything as pleasant to happen to me as this. I'm really I'm extremely grateful to you. Particularly coming as it does as a surprise. I do really appreciate it very much. person is also a surprise um, and it is Betty. Yeah, I know, don't look so shocked. <laughs> the thing is, we have to always recognize Betty. We, we know why, we've heard her speak, we know the work she does. Uh, you know, she does say she's the most hated woman in Morocco. I doubt that. I, I'm sure there are a lot of people in Morocco who love her as much as we love her. And uh, when we can, we want to show our love and uh, our respect because you really, really deserve it. And as this wonderful man said, tell me your name because I love you so much. Yeah? Noor. Ro Noor. Noor, yes, Noor. As Noor said, you know, uh, we are each other's family uh, and each other's support and you always have us and you'll always have him as well, so. just want to thank you and to thank Mariam, really, because uh, as I said, I cannot express myself in English, but what I'm doing in Morocco and what I'm living, it's really very, very hard because a lot of people and like progressive people or pro progressive activists or feminist organization uh, are really against what, what I'm doing, what I do, what I'm thinking, what I, I am. So I just want to say thank you because I don't want to cry. <laughs> thank you for all. Okay, our, our next beloved is Ina Shevchenko. Yeah. Now, Ina is, um, you know, she is fierce. She does represent uh, the Amazon, the sinner, and the revolutionary. And she is, uh, you know, she has inspired all of us. Uh, and I, I mentioned it before, you know, she gave me the bravery to go topless. And I was saying last time that I even forgot I was topless at Gay Pride. Uh, you know, and it, it is that sort of, that uh, in, in, empowering, inspiring people to love our bodies, to love who we are especially when there's so much hate around. And you have played such a huge role in all of our lives. And you do get a lot of shit as well. And, we, and that's why we really want, you know, every time there's an award, you're getting one, basically. <laughs> so you've got to come up and get it. But 
that's, that's true, that it's an absolute embarrassment getting every time an award <laughs> from you. <laughs> and um, indeed, as it was said, you, you are the people who deserve all the awards, but I actually think that you do not need any awards because you are the, the awards we are getting. You are really the best prizes we all can have. Really. <laughs> I'm really honest, I will cry right now. Betty, you didn't cry, I'll cry for you and for everybody here. But you know, I, I'm, I'm really, truly honored and very, very touched uh, by this particular award. Um, and it's not just because the, those words is something one has to say when you get an award, but I'm really touched because um, I think that uh, there is something uh, that this award and this, that this event and each of us, each of you here um, who spoke and who sits in this room symbolizes something very precious today and something unfortunately very rare. And this is a very simple thing and it's solidarity. It's so rare today and especially and unfortunately and it's so painful for me, it's, very, it's more and more rare among feminists. And, you know, I'm saying this because actually tonight I was supposed to be somewhere else. I was supposed to plead and preach my um, anti-clerical feminist at another event in Tenerife, uh, where I was invited in several months. And just a few days uh, before the event, a group of, um, they called themselves intersectional feminists, uh, staged um, a campaign uh, calling for, to boycott the event uh, with a lot of threats towards the organizers because my name was in the program. They did not want me to come because of my um, anti-clerical feminism. They did not want me to come and criticize uh, religious modesty dress code that they consider by definition as a choice. They did not want me to come and speak um, against um, uh, violent uh, religious traditions that they consider a culture and supposed to th something that's supposed to be respected and accepted. They kind of said that they are fighting for inclusiveness, yet what they did, they excluded another female voice. They claim that they fight sexism, yet they do not accept our criticism of one of the most uh, sexist ideologies, which are religious ideologies. They claim that they want to fight and uh, oppose every patriarch, but they do not want to hear us opposing the proto-patriarchs, all male uh, misogynist gods. They, they want to stop us from speaking. <laughs> standing and criticizing feminists, but I also feel it's my duty as a feminist, it's my duty to ring an alarm. How come, how and when religions hijacked feminism? How and when they managed to divide us? How and when right now they are succeeding? And despite that, despite that, and it's once again thanks to you, thanks to, to this event, to your voices, to this award as well, Despite this experience, I once again will call you all to, if you will get out of this room and have to keep one word in your mind, keep that word solidarity. That's something that we all need yeah. and that's something that is so precious and we will need it more and more and more. And I think that really we all learn in this room every time we get there, we all learn from you is that silence is a death penalty for our personalities and we should never, never, what, how, they can, whatever hard they can, they try to stop us from speaking. We should never give up. We should never allow anybody to stop us from speaking. They have right for their silence, but they have no right to stop us from speaking. So let's keep solidarity and let's keep. Uh, okay, now uh, this is. Uh you know, Mina Ahadi. You know, Mina Ahadi is someone who started this whole thing, really. Uh, you know, the whole ex-Muslim thing. And the idea behind it was that, you know, in Germany, women who've had abortions come out publicly to say they've done it uh, as a way of breaking the taboo. And, uh, you know, uh, she came up with the idea with other colleagues 
on doing this with ex-Muslims. And of course, she's been there from the beginning. It's the first council ever that has been created. She is a powerhouse. Uh, you know, honestly, I look at her and I get tired just reading about the stuff that she does. And, uh, you know, she's, she's active in the ex-Muslim movement against stoning, against the death penalty, to release political prisoners. She is really a powerhouse of a woman. Uh, she has inspired all of us. We love her so much, and it's the least we can do uh, to honor her work. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's basically her work that has brought us to this point where we are today. So we want to honor Mina and thank you, Mina, for your work. I speak German and Farsi. Farsi حرف میزنم. مریم ترجمه میکنه. خیلی خوشبختم و خیلی خوشحالم که من امشب اینجا هستم و منو دعوت کردین. I'm really happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. وقتی در مورد آتئیسم یا دست کشیدن از مذهب فکر میکنم زندگی من اینطوری بوده که بچه بودم از مذهب با مذهب آشنا شدم و نه سالم بود باید چادر سرم میکردم تو خیابون میرفتم When I think about atheism and renouncing and leaving Islam I think about my own experiences when as a nine year old girl I had to wear the hijab um, اسلام مثل یه دونه ترادیسیون مثل یه کلتور تو زندگی من بوده از بچگی و وقتی یه ذره بزرگ شدم بدنم تغییر کرد دیدم که همه چیز گناهه و من از بچگی بیگانه شدم با جسم خودم با روحیات و احساسات خودم When I started growing up and uh, I realized the more I grew up that this religion is alienating me from my body from my thoughts from my feelings it's a complete form of alienation یواش یواش شنیدم که یه چیزی تو بدنم هست که ناموس بقیه افراد خانواده است It's slowly, slowly, I found that everything related to my body is sinful and also that my body is the source of honor for other family members, male family members. And whenever I asked how come my brother can do this and that and I can't, the answer was always Allah says so. به مامانم گفتم که میخوام این الله رو از نزدیک بشناسم. I told my mother I want to meet this Allah up close to see him up close. یک قرآن برام آورد که زیر نویس فارسی داشت. She brought me a Quran that was subtitled in English. Persish. Persian. Persian. و وقتی این کتاب رو خوندم دیگه کاملا تقدسش از ذهنم افتاد یه کتاب در هم بر هم که اول یه چیز میگه آخر یه چیز میگه و گفتم اگه یه انتشاراتی عادی اینو میداد چاپ نمیکردن چون خیلی در هم بر هم این کتاب when she read it she realized that it's it's such a mixed up and a confused book the ending the beginning the middle it's all mixed up with each other and she thought if it was actually a book that had been sent to the publishers no one would bother <laughs> مذهب دست کشیدم و شروع کردم به نماز نخوندن نه مثل شما ولی یه مدت تکست نمیگفتم فقط خم می شدم بلند می شدم ببینم خدا چه عکس العملی نشون میده سه ماه طول کشید نماز نخوندم دیگه when i was uh, praying i used to uh, pray as well, like try to avoid praying all the time not the way sadia did it. <laughs> and uh, eventually what she did she just you know bent over and get up but don't say her prayers and see what would happen and actually nothing did happen so she gave it up completely chador ro dost nadashtam baram mazhar siyahi o be hisab nayomadan khodam midunastam The chador was uh, something that represented blackness for me, bleakness for me, and it was as if I was nothing. 
من بالاخره رفتم دانشگاه تبریز شادرم رو پرت کردم و شروع کردم یه ذره عادی زندگی کردن وقتی بزرگتر شدم I went to university in Tabriz and then I threw off the, the chador and went about my studies. Um, philosophy of life was to put a mini rock on Marx and I Marx on mini rock. My, uh, my philosophy in life was to wear a mini jup and read Marx. دوره پهلوی بود مارکس ممنوع بود مینی روک راحت بود تو زندگی من اینطوری شد که حکومت یه انقلاب شد من الان وقت زیاد ندارم ولی چون اولین بار اومدم یه ذره بیشتر حرف میزنم با اجازتون زندگی من اینطوری شد که حکومت اسلامی اومد سر کار انقلاب ایران شکست خورد و این دفعه اسلام به عنوان قدرت سیاسی اومد و قدرت رو گرفت توی ایران این دفعه با اسلام سیاسی طرف بودیم که خمینی اومد گفت زنا با اتجاب سرشون بکنن و من جلوی یه آینه استادم گفتم خانم احدی میخوایی دوباره این هجاب رو سرت بکنن But Mrs. Ahadi جواب داد نه. هر چی پیش بیاد. تو زندگی من ولی خیلی چیزا پیش اومد. به خاطر اینکه گفتم قبول نمی کنم حکومت اسلامی رو. In my life many things happened because I said I won't accept an Islamic regime. خانواده من روزی که خونه نبودم حمله شد به خونم و شش نفر از اعضای خانوادم و همسرم اعدام کردن بعدا When she wasn't home they uh, raided her home to try to arrest her uh, but six of her family members including her husband were arrested and executed من تو زندگی خودم سنگسا رو دیدم یعنی جنبش اسلامی اومد این دفعه دیگه با خانواده طرف نبودیم اینا اومدن و زن آوردن وسط خیابون دورش ایستادن سنگ زدن و کشتن من اینو دیدم تو ایران این زندگی من بعد از این سنگ سار خیلی فرق داشت با زندگی من روز قبل از این سنگ سار. My life after the stoning was very different from my life before seeing the stoning. این دفعه دیگه برای من آتئیسم و مبارزه با این مذهب یا ایدئولوژی دیگه یه معنای سیاسی خیلی خیلی مهمی به خودش گرفته بود. من سازمان درست کردم علیه اعدام، سازمان درست کردم علیه سنگ سار و فعالیت هایی کردیم که سنگ سار 2010 در ایران ممنوع شد. Uh, the activities around um, sorry um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, so I, I was uh, uh, very involved in fighting against religion and political religion uh, created several organizations including one against stoning and in 2010 uh, there was a moratorium on stoning وقتی اولین سنگ سار رو دیدم گفتم سب کن مینا اگه دنیا دنیای قرب بفهمه اینا با زنا چه کار میکنن ساعت ها از حرکت میستن I told myself if the world knows what's happening that people are being stoned that you know it would stop the world would stop for several hours ولی وقتی اومدم تو این دنیا مثل شما دیدم که به من گفتن خانم احدی ساکت باش این فرهنگ این فرهنگ یه دست که آدما را سنگ سار میکنه When I came to the west like you I heard people telling me this is their culture It's their culture to stone people to death. آرام باش، آرام باش. می‌تونیم یه ذره تغییر ایجاد کنیم. You can make a few changes perhaps, but you need to stay calm. دنیای غرب دو قسمت بود، دولت‌ها و مردم عادی. The Western societies were two sections, the people and government. وقتی برای مردم تعریف می‌کردم تو گوشای من صدای زنایی هست که سنگسار شدن، با من گریه می‌کردن. When I spoke to people about how the voices of women who've been stoned was in my ears, they would cry with me. And they stood up and opposed stoning. 
من رفتم آلمان خیلی کوتاه بگم اول دیدم که ما همه خارجی هستیم به مرور دیدم همه به ما میگن مسلمان من یه مصاحبه کردم با تلویزیون آلمان در مورد سنگسر نوشت مینا هدی زن مسلمان She said when I went to Germany for example immediately they just assumed she was Muslim and uh, there was an interview she did in a German paper where they said Mina Hadi a Muslim woman جنبش اسلامی اومد خارج حالا دیگه تمام میکنم و ما علیهش بلند شدیم و مبارزه کردیم اکس مسلم یک جواب سیاسی به دخالت جنبش اسلامی در اروپا تو زندگی مردم and uh, when uh, with the rise of islamism in the west The ex-Muslim movement is a political response to Islamism. و زنای ex-Muslim بسیار مهمان برای اینکه با اومدن این جنبش و با اسلام ما همه حقوقمون از دست میدیم. And women in particular are so crucial because with the coming of Islam in power, women lose all their rights. پس زنده بود مریم نمازی و همه کسانی که تو این جهت دارن مبارزه میکنن. Long live all of us. Und danke schön. Danke. Okay, so uh, we also want to add that we've got two uh, awards of people who are not here. One is uh, Armin Nabavi for his work with the Atheist Republic. <laughs> Brilliant blasphemous filmmaker Nadia Fani. Yeah. And uh, our, our final award this year uh, goes to our gorgeous, wonderful, brilliant, where the hell, oh, there she is, Shelly Segal. <laughs> Now, we know, we know it's not appropriate since we are ex-Muslims and atheists to say people have uh, the voice of an angel, but she bloody does. <laughs> If angels had voices, that is how they would sound. <laughs> and you know, she's just, um, she is, uh, her voice is uh, incredible, but also the lyrics of her songs are so incredible. You know, she talks about free thought, about atheism, about women's rights. And uh, the last time we were at a conference uh, last year in November, I asked her to please come up and sing a song, uh, that one of her songs that represented women's liberation. And of course she came here and she sang a completely new song that she had penned while we were having our discussions. Uh, and so we thought, uh, you know, this woman uh, is, uh, is our voice really, because there isn't many singers um, that is the voice of free thinkers and atheists uh, who defend women's rights and doing it so beautifully as well. So we want to, we want to really recognize her because she's always been here, uh, most times really paying for her own flight just so she can come and support us. Her wonderful partner Rob, who also co-writes some of her songs, oh, there he is. Um, you know, so we, wa we wanted to recognize this wonderful woman and to thank her for her lyrics for her voice, uh, because you are our voice and we need your voice always. I have to say I am incredibly honored and also echo the sentiments of not deserving an award in such a room. Uh, thank you so much to, to the Council of Ex-Muslims, to all of your organizers and volunteers and members. Uh, your bravery, your love of freedom is so inspiring and it changes lives and it changes the world. And if in any way I can help to amplify your voice, uh, that is the greatest honor. So I uh, thank you so much for this award. And uh, I'm excited to share some new songs with you tonight. Thank you very much.